Hello, and welcome to the seventh installment of the speaker series, The Liberal Imaginary and Beyond, which is co-sponsored by the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. I'm Benjamin Schuhl, a senior fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics and director of the Center on Modernity and Transition, and I'll be one of your hosts for the speaker series. And I'm Sharzad Sabet. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and I'm also your host for this series. The aim of the speaker series is to examine the origins, contents, and developments of liberalism after the Second World War, as well as to consider significant attempts to move beyond the resultant social imaginary without casting aside its impressive achievements. We're thrilled to have with us today Luke Bretherton and Charles Matthews, who will be discussing the topic, Political Theology and the Foundations of Liberal Thought. Luke Bretherton is Robert E. Cushman Professor of Moral and Political Theology at the Duke Divinity School and author of Christ in the Common Life, Political Theology and the Case for Democracy. Charles Matthews is the Carolyn M. Barber Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia and author of The Republic of Grace and A Theology of Public Life. Luke, Chuck, welcome. So we like to begin these conversations on a personal biographical note. Um, so I'd like to ask if maybe you could each tell us a bit about the experiences and personal histories, the questions and the curiosities that led you to think and write about political theology. Chuck, maybe we can start with you. Sure, okay. Um, well, there, I guess there's two ways of going about this, uh, the kind of very existential and personal and then the academic. Uh, let me start with the existential and personal. Um, I grew up uh, overseas uh, in, in Saudi Arabia uh, with a family that was uh, doing work in the oil industry. And uh, I remember coming home at, from school every day at lunchtime and listening to the uh, AP UPI wires um, from like the uh, grade, grade three forward. So from my youth, I was always interested in world affairs in part because the world affairs were effectively our home affairs. They were affecting us. Um, and that experience of traveling around the world and knowing the world exists um, has stuck with me forever. Along with that, as a person, you end up always connecting the personal and the political. And um, I had a, a very loving family, but both my mother and my father had been decisively marked by larger political events. Uh, my father had served as an infantryman in Korea, um, and I don't think he had a, a solid night of sleep in his life after that experience. Um, and my mother was a, a very proper um, and um, a wonderful person who believed deeply in what I would consider now uh, uh, the mainline Christian propriety gospel, right? Not the prosperity gospel, but the propriety gospel. Um, and living with them and learning to be a human from them really affected the way I thought about reality in general and seeing how their personal lives were connected to politics meant for me um, that my life was connected to larger political currents as well. And so from a very early age, I had those connections between the most intimate experiences of my life and larger geopolitical forces. Um, and then, you know, uh, I went to grad school, uh, well, I went to college in the late eighties and grad school in the nineties. And it was an interesting time to be thinking uh, about religion and politics and political theology. Um, broadly at that moment, I would say, I'd like to know what Luke thinks about this, um, a broad political liberal consensus was in some ways pretty predominant in the academy in general. And um, uh, people maybe like Luke and I, I don't want to enroll him in this, but uh, we might have been the kind of fugitive resistance in some ways trying to argue that things were being left out of the story. Um, and uh, it, it helped me uh, a great deal to have a number of teachers who did that as well. So that's kind of how I, I came to see this, is that in the, in the 90s, it felt like uh, political and theological issues were very potent, but it didn't seem like the scholarship I was encountering had a way of bringing it as fully and as fruitfully into focus as I thought it should. I think that's all I, I would say. Thanks very much, Chuck. Uh, Luke, let's hear, let's hear from you. Yeah, so very, I mean, I, I'd say some very parallel to to Chuck. I mean, I so the house I grew up in, um, so I grew up in London, West London, um, and uh, my parents were very um, Anglicans, but involved in kind of evangelicals and then involved in the charismatic movement. Uh, so very, very strongly religious, very conservative. But paradoxically, in some ways, they were uh, also very involved in 
local small d democratic politics, as I would frame it now. Uh, so they were appalled uh, when they moved into the bit of West London I, I kind of grew up in. Um, it had a notorious reputation for a slum landlord, and it was the first generation of what's called the Windrush generation of um, Afro-Caribbean migrants coming to work on in utilities and in, on London transport and things. Um, and they were treated appallingly, but they would also go to church and so, you know, my parents are nice middle class folk and they were just appalled by this. And so set up a housing association before there was any even government legislation to do that. This is in the early 60s um, and uh, went out and raised money from friends and bake sales and bought houses, did them up and pro mm. to provide um, good quality housing to low income families. And we're consistently involved in those kinds of initiatives. Um, and yet my father thought Mrs. Thatcher was a hero and, you know, uh, the country was going to the dogs and the liberals were going to ruin everything. And I'm like, and so that we'd have these huge arguments and, and, and it seems to be entirely contradictory, the position at the, at the dinner table of like, how can you be doing helping all these poor people and Mrs. Thatcher's killing them, literally, you know, and. So my, it became such an extent that my mother banned me from having any conversations about religion and, and politics. It's a ban that's still, still in place, I think. But like any good son, I went and made a career of it. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so that but I mean, it came to fruition really after I left university um, and kind of the questions I've wrestled with throughout my kind of academic life. Um, kind of came into focus really after university. I worked for a little bit in Parliament and then I, I worked for six or seven years in the um, context of Central and Eastern Europe and also traveled to, did some work in Russia and Armenia and Kazakhstan and, and places like that. Um, and in the, that context, saw this kind of intense, uh, 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 highly divided context emerge. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this was the context, so post 89, this was the context in which the great emancipatory secular future of Marxism died overnight um, and and the kind of European Marxist project collapsed and so the kind of great ideological hope of a religion free future suddenly was gone and in its place rushed you know it's the Mormons every evangelical group the resurgence of the Orthodox Church and I was working with these kinds of groups and across these groups um, I was doing kind of knowledge what we now call knowledge transfer kind of project work um, and, and at the same time, you saw the rise of ethno-religious nationalism. You saw the rise in a kind of turbocharged capitalism driven by a kind of a kleptocratic class who, who, you know, people like Abramovich and others emerge. That all being stewarded by what we'd now call a kind of post-ideological set of populist leaders, you know, Putin being a primary example, but I, I, I saw close up and was involved with folk um, dealing with someone called Vladimir Mechiar in Slovakia, who was a kind of early harbinger of these kinds of figures. Um, and, uh, and, and that was all taking place in this context of globalization and, and suddenly everyone operating in the same. And so you had, whether it is Czech arms sales to kind of uh, Iran or um, Volvo, uh, not Volvo, Vox, um, uh, uh, people who make golf taking over factories in Slovakia, the kind of single economic social space and, and media space emerging. Um, and, and I thought, how does, how does the church make sense of this context? And realising, you know, I was, I was based in London and a lot of the issues I was seeing in Technicolor in the Central Eastern European context were there in London as well. And so that, that sense that the kind of, as, as Chuck said, this kind of regnant settled view that I was reading of political liberalism as the norm and 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 I was like this is just a million miles away from the mm. facts on the ground it has nothing to say about capitalism which is destroying these countries it has nothing to say about ethno-religious nationalism it's just an aberration or an atavistic survival of a previous age and the you know as one person put it kind of post-secular you know the world is becoming as furiously religious as as ever so I, I kind of thought there's something not quite right and that that was really the stimulus for a lot of the questions of you know questions about how do we address issues of poverty and justice how do you take seriously your own cherished beliefs and sense of belonging and identity but but in a kind of non-exclusionary way that you end up killing your neighbors 
Uh, and how do we navigate asymmetries of power constructively mm -hmm. in a ways that actually a, a, a kind of build life rather than a, a built on depriving it from from others so so yeah so those are the kind of core questions I've, I've been wrestling with and and both have defended liberalism but also been critical of liberalism because of its insufficiencies to really give an account of this kind of reality of the world I think that's emerged since 89. Well, thank you both for sharing uh, that really interesting um, personal history with us. I want to start the conversation with a very basic and hopefully straightforward question, namely, what is political theology? How do you understand and use the term? And why should those of us who are concerned with the well-being of society care about or take an interest in it? Luke, why don't you start us off? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. Obviously, one wrestles with this. Um, I, I think I divide. I, I think there are kind of three angles into the into the question, uh, answering the question. The first is just at a at a most general level. I use the term, and I think it's become used as kind of theological and perhaps now religious reflection on politics. So that is kind of most generic form. Um, but within that, we might say that there's masked a, a kind of um, emerging field. And there's, we might also say there's an, an emerging field called political theology, which is a particular way of analyzing and has its own journals and networks, etc. And it's a multidiscipline, multidisciplinary field, anthropology and sociology and all sorts of areas. Um, but and that is building off, a, I think, a particular historical uh, set of debates and conversations. Um, beyond this kind of more wide level generic term. And, and that we can look to particularly debate. I, I think there are parallels outside of Europe uh, and we can look at debates around Indian national emergence of Indian national consciousness, other, other kinds of contexts, but I'll focus on the European story. Um, but the, but in that story, I think if you look to the 19th century and in a context where you have, you know, industrialization, urbanization, massive social shifts, the move from rural, popular, largely rural populations to urban populations, all these kinds of things. You've got this kind of what you might call revolution and reaction um, going on. And uh, so on one side, you have highly revolutionary thought that's very critical of the way modernity and certain strands of modernity, we can think of anarchist thought, communist thought, this is modernity critical structures which actually I think the first person who uses his political theology, theology as a term is Bakunin, you know, founding figure of, of anarchism. Um, it's similar ideas are there in Proudhon, again, a founding figure of anarchism. Um, and this kind of critique of a certain kind of modernity operating at a, at a radical level. Um, and then at the same time, you've got also a form of modernity critique. Um, and and both, of, both of them remember a critic of liberalism. Uh, you've said, all got a, a kind of form of hyper Augustinian, um, largely reactionary uh, modernity critique. People like de Maistre and de Bonald and, and, and emerging in France and Spain and elsewhere. Um, and they view political theology as, as, as a kind of resource to critique modernity, whereas the kind of radical end views it as, uh, as a kind of means of leverage to say, this is just the ancien regime writ large, this is just repetition of the same. Um, but, but, but I think one way to understand political theology as a term and its history of emergence is as sutured or indexed into certain kinds of radical and reactionary uh, modernity criticism in which liberalism sits at the center of that. Um, and so we can look to someone like Austria and Germany in the early 20th century. On the one side, you have Carl Schmitt, who kind of makes the term political theology famous. Um, he, is, of course, being a Nazi jurist and um, seeing political theology and, and modern politics as borrowing political uh, terms from theology, like sovereignty is a first theological term before it's a political term. Um, and again, uh, more concerned, and, and Eric Peterson, who's disputing, and then figures like Walter Benjamin or Ernst Bloch, similarly a radical side, seeing the insufficiency of a certain kind of liberal capitalist modernity and, and looking to things like communism as a form of millenarian or chiliastic thought uh, and notions of political religion as really you can't make sense of the modern 
and its political forms if you don't take the theological seriously. Um, and whether that's its ritual processes, whether that it's borrowings of explicitly theological terms, whether that's um, that pol politics itself is inherently a metaphysical demand. So if you think about Rawls's notion that we should exclude comprehensive doctrines, political theology says that's crazy. You know, we're always going to have to ask questions of meaning and purpose, questions of being and ontology. You can't avoid these questions. They're written into the fabric of politics because politics is about how we're going to live together and, and how should we live together and what is life for? Um, and that gets played out in differential tax regimes and, you know, how we manage municipal waterworks and things. But there's this sense of um, these bigger, quite, there are always kind of these bigger questions in play. And so a view of politics in this kind of Weberian, but we could trace it back to Hobbes's notion of politics as a kind of machine, the state as a machine and kind of operating this very mechanistic view or procedural view of politics. Politics is, is not reducible to that mechanistic or procedural vision. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of Schmidt's critique of liberalism is it, it's kind of too reductive of actually how what's going on in politics. And you, you can look at something like Nazism or communism, and we can see that just these aren't reducible to that kind of Weberian style vision. So I think out of that, and if we, particularly then I, I'll end with this, the kind of post 1989 project, where you have the collapse of the kind of high modern secularist um, projects, both emancipatory and conservative, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, to give a very concrete example, take critiques emerging around the Dakota pipeline. At, at the moment. They're not looking to socialism. They're not looking to mm -hmm. communism. They're not looking to liberalism to stage those debates and critiques, they look to indigenous thought and the spiritualities and ancestral wisdoms embedded in those. And I saw this in the kind of road protests in the 1990s, a kind of observative part in, in, in Britain. Suddenly people were showing up using Gaia and Wicca and using kind of chanting rituals. This wasn't the politics of the new left of the 60s. Um, and so I think that when you have the collapse of those high modern projects, and you want to critique a certain kind of framing of liberal capitalist modernity as the norm, where do you turn? Mm -hmm. Religious frames of reference, whether Christian, whether Islamic, whether Buddhist, whatever they are, whether Wiccan spirituality, are going to turn up more and more. And so part of what I would, what I would say is why does it matter? and Why should people kind of good liberal, nice technocratic academic folk care about this? is because where do the resources of critique come from? And do we, if we're going to get out of sort of groupthink of a certain kind of norm normative political liberalism, what, what are the resources for that critique once the kind of high modern project is, is kind of is on skid row? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chuck, same question to you. What is political theology and why should we care about it? I mean, I, I think I mostly agree with with a lot of what Luke said. Um, I, I will say uh, some things both more abstract and more banal as a kind of compliment, I think, to what Luke was doing. Um, uh, on the more abstract way, uh, I, I often say that uh, political theology is about the theology in politics and the politics in theology. Um, so that I actually think it, it goes both ways. Um, to think in political theological terms makes you responsible for thinking about how uh, what might seem to you if you're doing kind of systematic theology or whatever as rather straightforwardly, um, un uncomplicatedly idealistic theological claims actually have a large degree of political implication in how they get cashed out. Um, so one of my teachers was Kathy Tanner. She's very good about this, laying out the kind of structures of, of, of implicature and obligation that, you know, certain construals of what, um, uh, of what doc, 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 doctrinal claims or dogmatic uh, affirmations will entail for communities. And a lot of uh, work in religious studies, not only theological, but um, more critical or historical or cultural work in religious studies, has um, increasingly over the past few decades to very good effect held theological and ethical claims feet to the fire on this to think about the politics of those theological claims. I think that's an important part of what we should construe as political theology. Although I agree with Luke that um, it's more the other side of that, which is 
um, the theology within the politics. Uh, in other words, here, when people make political claims, we by and large um, operate with them and engage with those, those arguments at a kind of straightforwardly surface level of whether or not these are wise policy uh, arguments, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's clear over the past at least 30 years and probably more um, that many of our political claims are actually uh, metaphysical arguments um, that have manifested themselves as policy debates. Uh, and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, I have a lot of affection for the projects of broadly kind of Rawlsian or post-Rawlsian um, liberal egalitarian projects of the sort that, say, a, a scholar like Cecile Laborde does. I think that's very impressive and very important. Um, and I think that a scholar like Laborde would actually agree that a great deal of our politics um, would fall outside of this kind of uh, basic ambit of the purely Rawlsian um, idiom. Um, and that the, the, the part of politics that falls outside of that ambit, um, even a scholar um, committed to a kind of Rawlsian project like a scholar like Cecile Laborde would say is broadly, I think, something I would see as political theological. When we have debates about what the nature of community is, when we have debates uh, about uh, the nature of infrastructure, which we're having in the United States right now, we are having debates that are important parts about what the nature of our community is, who we are as creatures, what we are aiming for, uh, what the goods of our lives are. The entire discussion recently in the infrastructure debate around care has struck me as a really interesting moment of thinking about not just what um, the policy issues around care are, but also stepping back and thinking about the kinds of creatures we are and how, what are our obligations to care for and nurture one another, mm -hmm. and also to be cared for and nurtured by one another. So there's a really interesting moment there where kind of it seems to me um, a form of political theology has emerged at least indirectly um, in the last couple of weeks in our, in our public mm -hmm. debate. So those are just the two kind of dimensions I would say you have to think about the politics within theology and the theology within politics. Um, the more uh, banal thing I'll say, um, I think Luke would agree with this. I'd like to hear from him. I think there's actually three distinct, somewhat distinct communities of scholars working in this area. Um, and I think uh, uh, I, I emerged more from one than the other two, though I have come more in acquaintance with the others. And I think people haven't fully realized that these conversations are relatively distinct still, and I think this is lamentable, and they have relatively distinct bibliographies. So the three conversations around political theology, as I understand them are, uh, right, the first one that Luke pointed out, which is the kind of what I would call the critical political theology tradition, which emerges out of kind of Schmidt and Schmidt's earlier, uh, Cortez, Denosos, um, and others. Um, and then in the 60s and 70s is kind of underground. And then really after the Cold War, a lot of um, uh, post-liberal or anti-liberal thought emerges as forms of political theology in this way, appropriating both the Schmidtian uh, line through agonism, say, and then also other forms of like the Frankfurt School and stuff, uh, and then Foucault and, and Foucault's notions of biopolitics. All this emerges into a conversation, which is only occasionally hosted in right, religious studies or theology departments. Um, recently, a number of enterprising scholars have really uh, crystallized this and, as Luke pointed out, made it into a larger network uh, of, of inquiry, which I think is, is really exciting. Um, that's one. Um, this body of literature is, I think, mostly critical. Um, and in fact, I think there's a weakness in it that um, it often suffers from what Habermas accused Foucault of, of crypto normativity. Um, and I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of resources there to engage, but it's also uh, something that has some issues to work on as well. Secondly, I would say there's the tradition, especially in Christianity, though not only in Christianity, of what I would call magisterial political theology. Um, and by this, I mean figures like Oliver O'Donovan, a kind of very important uh, political theologian in the UK. Uh, in America, uh, Duke's own Stanley Hauerwas actually would be in this area. Um, uh, scholars in the broadly liberationist school uh, of what uh, O'Donovan once called the, the Southern School. I love that, the Southern School. It sounds terrible. like the ACC or something like that. It's great. But, yeah, it's um, terrible. Yeah, it's, 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 very, it's, very, it's very Oliver. But um, the idea here is mostly people who think about, in a reasonably one-way direction, how the doctrines and history of thinking in uh, explicit religious traditions carry over into thinking about political um, issues. Um, so it's a relatively one-way conversation in that sense. And it's um, often uh, straightforwardly constructive, um, occasionally hortatory, 
Um, and uh, people like me who in some ways come out of this, this uh, tradition of inquiry um, are potentially a little too unguarded and unself-critical uh, in our thinking. And then the third I would say is um, the broader area, and that's by the way, that, that conversation is mostly hosted it seems to me in theology um, and a little bit in religious studies, but, but mostly in kind of confessional theological uh, programs and a little bit of uh, actually Jewish political thought has some stuff here as well. Um, and then the third would be the broader area that we often call uh, liberal political thought, uh, Rawlsian and post-Rawlsian thought, um, much of which in, spends so much of its time insisting that it's not religious, uh, mm -hmm. that as a good psychoanalyst, you have to wonder why they are insisting so often that they are not religious. The way in which religion functions as a figure of what they are not is a really interesting fact. And it seems to me that only in the past generation or so that you've gotten some really good scholars thinking about how to understand liberalism as opposed to its imagined um, religious other. So again, I mentioned Laborde, um, and there are others, a scholar named Eric Nelson, I think very highly of on this too. Um, and that's again, a, a tradition that's more in um, Anglophone political theory in some ways. Uh, and uh, along with a figure like Rawls, uh, there's a number of very good people out there um, uh, Laborde is an obvious person. I would say also a, a somewhat older figure now, but very, very important is uh, Jeremy Waldron. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say those are three different communities that are working in this area. Um, and that unfortunately, actually, we often don't talk to each other. Um, and we haven't really, uh, I think, metabolized the lessons and the insights that each of those communities uh, actually has for us. It would be fascinating to have a serious Rawlsian Schmidtian conversation around sovereignty. Um, and it seems to me that that has not yet uh, emerged. So anyway, that's maybe too much information. Yeah, I'd, let me, I just, I just want to add a little bit, a couple, a couple sure. of things to that. I mean, I think, so I, I think there's a, there is, we do see these crossover conversations. So just on the political liberalism, realizing it's also a kind of religious or crypto religious project. I think um, there's some very interesting developments in political theory. And, and we can look at the, I was very influenced by the Cambridge School of Quentin Skinner and and mm. um, and Richard Tuck and others, but I think you see that. And I, I remember I was taught by them at university, and they would always teach texts like Hobbes and 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 Locke as if they there was no theology in them. And I think we do see a reaction against that. And figures like um, Teresa Bejan, and who's now at Oxford, the the role of narrating and making sense of key political concepts like non domination which is kind of getting a lot of airplay and the role of theology in the constitutively and what and theology doing constructive work in those kinds of notions or toleration or all sorts of kind of key political notions and where theology seem to have a kind of constructive role. So I think there's a, there's a way in which political theory is kind of owning and getting more comfortable with the theological. Right. That's, that's the first round. I think there was a missing element though, which kind of crosses all three, which is a, which has particular force in the American context, which is, and one can frame this in terms of um, the dis kind of discovery of society in the 19th century. And lots of figures of like Polanyi and Hannah Arendt and lots of people kind of, a, you know, concerned about this in, in political thought and, and thinking about political economy. But I think what you see is with the rise of industrialization, with the emergence of things like totalitarianism, huge state structures, um, huge economic structures, and the, the, the discovery of something called society, and we see that, uh, it, it's sociology, the study of society, but we see huge range of movements, the social gospel, Christian socialism, uh, social Christianity, like right across the board, there's this move in churches in particular, how do you tend and defend the social over and against its commodification in the market and its instrumentalization by the state. Um, and and in, in, the, in the American context, the emergence of the social gospel, how that taps into earlier roots, things like the abolition movement, um, mm. that I think, and, and the kind of reformist project, and, and that is, is um, both critical of modernity, but is in some ways a, a founding origin stream feeding into progressivism and the and the holding up of the liberal state as an answer um, to either concentrations of power in the state or concentrations of power in the market. 
Um, and so there, I think that that social, the discovery of the social, and that's not a, just a religious thing. I think lots of people are making that discovery and, and, and we can view socialism as a movement as part of that kind of broader and much more broadly besides. But but I think the way religious thought feeds into and then feeds into creation of things like social work, youth work, settlement houses, we can, the whole vast swathe of social care infrastructure in America emerges out of that social gospel movement. Mm. You can say, you can look at ethics as a discipline, whether religious ethics or not, as emerging out of that in the state. So I think that's, a, that's again, not often attended to in conversations about political theology. I think that is a form of political theology. It's a very important one. Um, gave rise to key intellectual Rauschenbusch and then on, I think you could argue Niebuhr is standing on. And so I think that cuts across all three of those conversations that yeah. that, um, that Chuck was laying out very, very helpfully and clearly. Um, but I think it's often not thought as a, of a, as a kind of origin story of uh, political theology. And I think someone who's kind of held Gary Dorian, who's a historian of social gospel and aligned movements in the States, I think has kind of made that point recently that both in Europe and in context, this things like Catholic social teaching and, and from 1893 onwards in Rerum Neverum emerging, that you, you can't make sense of it outside of this kind of defense of the social. Um, and I think that carries on, whether we're thinking about surveillance capitalism or, you know, it, it shouldn't surprise us that religious folk get upset about AI if something like AI is going to threaten human dignity, the, the integrity of the person, and atomize and disaggregate society and, and forms of community. So this is often framed in kind of communitarian terms, but I think I think there's this is a consistent strand that's there, and the and the ability to attend to the social and structures of care is, is pretty key. Um, and is again, is an unattended to form of political theology. <laughs> Chuck, I, I want to get your response to that, but our next question is directly related. So let me present it and then and then let you pick up from there. Um, liberalism, broadly defined, represents a set of perhaps uniquely powerful ideas in the post-war uh, social, political, and intellectual landscape of this of the, of the West. And the speaker series, um, of course, has been exploring this post-war liberal imaginary in some depth for several weeks now. One of the contentions of your work is that we can't understand contemporary liberalism without understanding political theology, and we can't understand political theology without understanding liberalism. From your perspective then, and, and you've already begun to discuss this, how have ideas originating in religion shaped both the intellectual foundations of liberal thought as well as current expressions of liberalism in contemporary society? And how can religious thought and liberal thought, these two compelling forces of modern society, uh, illuminate, complement, and potentially strengthen one another? Chuck? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I, I, I was only going to enthuse on what Luke was saying, uh, and I'll enthuse a little bit here. So I wasn't, uh, uh, I think, a big disagreement. There might be something, but we'll, we'll find out. Um, but on liberalism in general and on the post-war liberal imaginary, I like this uh, idea a lot. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, and I say this to my grad students now, it's always good to buy low and sell high. Uh, when I was coming up in the 90s, um, it was a harder market for people who were interested in, um, uh, it, was, it was a saturated market, let's say, for people who were interested in playing out a kind of liberal mindset. And it was a relatively more open market for people like me who were interested in grousing about how um, things, were, things were terrible. Um, in liberalism. And uh, I would actually say now, and I do say to my grad students, that um, many of the most interesting works I'm finding are works that are attempting to say, actually, there's something interesting to be said about liberalism, and we need to pay better attention to it. Um, interestingly, that hasn't hit religious studies yet, I think, uh, definitely not in uh, theology either. Um, I have a longstanding gripe about our fields that we seem to be disciplinarily a little too self-enclosed, but I won't worry about that here. Let me say something about the post-war liberal imaginary and your, your good, very good questions. Um, look, there's a lot of different things that go under the canopy of liberalism, um, and I, you need to be very careful about differentiating what we're talking about here. Um, Luke and I might have a real disagreement about the degree to which a figure like Hobbes can be considered a liberal. Um, uh, someone like me, who has a prettier story, a happier story to tell, often will locate it more on someone like Locke 
um, and uh, be less concerned with a figure like Hobbes. Um, but that might be um, uh, more in the weeds than we need to go. Um, also, it'd be important to differentiate neoliberalism, which seems to have become almost entirely a four letter word these days uh, from liberalism itself. And then again, uh, it's also important to recognize the uh, transatlantic differences of these discourses where liberalism in the US um, can sound more like centrism in some ways in uh, the EU um, and liberalism in the EU sounds a little more like libertarianism in the US. Um, I would say that many of the complaints about liberalism of the past uh, generation or so have had repeatedly a hard time not throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, when they start complaining. Um, and that's a problem that I think actually goes back, as I said, uh, to uh, some of the concerns uh, about uh, liberalism that were voiced in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, concerns that I find most interestingly pointed by a figure like Jürgen Habermas with his accusations of crypto normativity, Nancy Fraser, another figure uh, who did this as well on, on kind of more uh, critical, critical theory approaches. Um, uh, I, would, I would say on liberalism and Christianity, it's deep history. Clearly liberalism emerges out of the matrix of Christendom in some way, both as development and as reaction against. Um, and it, it seems to me that it's the narratives we tell often uh, highlight one of those sides without necessarily recognizing the implicature of both. Um, there's a great deal of evidence that Western liberal individualism, what we call Western liberal individualism, really does emerge out of um, a, a legal and institutional context where for a millennium, uh, the Christian churches were undertaking a um, sustained campaign against kin networks. Right, so that instead of being a part of your family or your clan, first and foremost, you were a member of the church. And so anthropologists and historians have, um, have made this case, I think, pretty compellingly um, that the structures, uh, the, the kin based structures of early medieval Europe are um, by and large dissolved over the course of the Middle Ages by the, the un, unrelenting legal pressure of the churches. Um, it's also the case that Europe, unlike many other parts of the world, has an enormously polychromatic political uh, situation. Uh, the European condensation of sovereignty really only happens in modernity. Um, and when you get, you know, at the beginning of the, was it the 15th century, Charles Tilly, the political the sociologist has this great story. It's like at the beginning of the 16th century, you have something like uh, what, 600 sovereignties in Europe. And then two centuries later, you have 30. Right, so that enormous condensation is a really interesting fact. It's um, interesting though, that even with 30, you still have in the European, in the sphere of Christendom, many rival political um, structures, which are legitimate um, and which is not actually all that common elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, in, in complicated ways, for example, um, in Chinese thought, there's always the idea that a central imperial structure is a very attractive thing to have. Um, in uh, a lot of uh, is Islamic thought, there's a complicated question about the rivalries of sovereignties of different caliphates and stuff like that. So the interesting fact that state structures have been so thoroughly pried apart from um, theopolitical structures of legitimacy in the European context is a really worthwhile uh, thing to think about. Um, there are also uh, developments in Christianity which generate both liberal shoots and illiberal uh, counter reactions. Um, and a scholar like James Simpson, um, who has written about how uh, the Reformation can be conceived of as the illiberal roots of liberal modernity um, is a good figure here to, to look at. Um, but I would say uh, one important way that liberalism remains importantly related to Christianity for good and bad, um, really anchors itself in the kind of ongoing difficulty of uh, this conceptual structure of Protestant individualism, which is in some ways the one of the organic matrices out of which this liberalism comes, um, the ways in which this, the reflexive conceptual assumptions of Protestant individualism render it hard for us to bring into view um, many of the challenges uh, uh, that face our world today. And here's where actually uh, what Luke was saying about society is I think spot on. Um, it seems to me that the way that liberalism emerged as a defense of the idea of liberal privacy in some important way in a figure like Locke really is a very important moment in political thought and one that I think we want to cherish and value and protect 
the idea of the individual and the sanctity of the individual is very important. The problem was, it seems to me, that that picture really differentiated those political situation into two things. There's authority and the individual. There's not really any larger ecology of institutions or in framing structures around them. Um, and so by the time you get to someone like uh, Marx in the 19th century, or even a, a figure like Wollstonecraft at the end of the 18th century, you generate this idea that in fact, there are other forces in the social system uh, that are actually operating on the individual and the society in ways that the society needs to take account of, but which are liberal categories don't make it very easy to do. Um, and it seems to me, in fact, ironically, that for all of uh, later liberal thinkers like Rawls's efforts to bring into view this institutional ecology, um, uh, in fact, they, they have failed precisely because it always comes back to this kind of ongoing romance of the individual and the state. Um, and it seems to me, and this is, I, I, I take it in some ways, the part of the critique that Katrina Forrester and others have leveled against Rawls is that in some ways the, the, the vision of politics is not polychromatic enough in his, in his account. Um, so and that seems to me to go right back to Marx, right? And Marx's complaints about what liberalism leaves out of the picture, how it leaves things like the economy, the market, uh, gender and race out of the picture. It, you can't really bring those as politically um, important into view. Um, so if I think about liberalism's uh, historically uh, narrow social imaginary, I don't say emaciated, but you know, more, uh, more angry people might call it emaciated. Um, it, it seems to me that that's a really important feature of it that is still haunting us. And I think it actually relates back to that early Christian notion that, um, and maybe mediated through a figure like Luther. So this is why it might be a Protestant Christian thing, I'm not sure. But that early Christian notion that in some sense, the believer stands before the state and has to confess or profess their belief. Um, and that those are the two forces that are effectively at, at play in that, in that moment. Um, so that's, that's all I would say broadly about that. Um, I think liberalism has many uh, positive roots in Christianity. It has some negative roots in Christianity, and it has some positive and negative roots that um, are both totally separate from Christianity and that are developed in response to um, and reaction against opposition to um, a certain Christian political imaginary as well. That might be uh, yeah, so let, let me pick up, uh, kind of amplify a couple of points Chuck, Chuck's made in, in response to that question. I think, so I think he's, he's right. It's very important to see these two as interactive and kind of mutually constitutive. And they're often, we tell a, a kind of declension narrative or a secularization narrative. Liberalism is the rejection of Christianity or religion more generally, um, or we have a kind of ascension narrative, uh, you know, their liberalism really can't be liberal without religion. And there's figures, neoconservative figures, and uh, we can look at a journal like First Things as kind of telling that story repeat repeatedly. Um, Christianity or religion anchors liberalism in a, in a way. So I, I think neither of those stories are adequate or fit, fit for purpose. There, there's, as Chuck said, it's much more interactive and there's always a traffic going both ways. And there's always a way in which both sides of that traffic are kind of denying the borrowings and debts they owe. Um, and But I think just to pick on something Chuck said earlier, I, I do think there is an important way, part of the problem on the liberal side of that ledger, liberal political thought, is this uh, uh, way in which religion is the other it imagines itself over and against, and, and is a constitutive other. It really is a friend-enemy relation in, in kind of Schmittian terms. And so, you know, if you're liberal, you're rational, you're sensible, uh, you work with empirical evidence, um, you know, you value the individual. If you're religious, you're overly passionate and emotional, you're uh, uh, irrational, subject to forces outside of the state, and you favour the collective over the individual. We could kind of increase that list, you know, on. Um, but when we really look at it, and our, our friend and colleague Eric Gregory's done some great work, you know, on, on a figure like John Rawls, you know, Rawls in a sense would play out with that story in his kind of in, in his um, political liberalism book, he tells, tells something of that story in, in the introduction. But actually turns out, you know, 
it, his is liberal Protestantism writ large. You know, if we look at his early work and drawing on Augustine, and so we see that Rawls himself is entirely indebted to a kind of conceptual architecture. Um, and I think we could trace this back. Something I think that was missing from Chuck's story is this kind of church state um, dynamic and the kind of constant conflict between Pope and Emperor over millennia and the sense in which I think there is a, a, a wrestling within liberalism itself that Christianity in particular presses. And you see this, Hobbes, going back to Hobbes, I would see him as ambiguously within the liberal tradition, um, trying to kind of create a singular state within which religion and the church particularly was subsumed to the state. You get a figure like Rousseau, very different from Hobbes, and I think it's in the social contract, looking to Hobbes and he was the first to join the two heads of the eagle, i.e., you know, it's a classic imperial emblem, but there are two heads of the eagle who are pulling in different directions. The church pulling in one direction with its own source of authority, the state and sovereign structures uh, pulling in the other direction. And the, and the kind of nightmare of liberalism is that the church is constantly representing a threat to that point of singularity and cohesive, uh, uh, both social and political order. Um, and so there's, a, there's both a kind of imagining of the other, but also an institutional kind of wrestling with the church. And then subsequently, I would put in their trade unions, uh, other religious groups, all forms of sociality and their institutional expressions, which kind of contest the singular authority of the state structure. Um, and that, that is, I think that is the kind of shadow side of liberalism, which it, 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 it uh, doesn't often acknowledge um, and forms itself over in reaction against relig a religious other. Now, I think what Chuck was pointing to was kind of what might call negative liberalism that he's a fan of. Um, I think there is a lot of creative work there and, and, and some account of the limited state, the rule of law uh, as protection of the individual protection uh, uh, of against concentrations of power. I'm a huge fan of that. It's when liberalism becomes steps beyond that in a sense, negative defensive logic and becomes a kind of metaphysical totalizing project that we then have problems and suddenly religion shows up as the kind of great pathology it has to expunge from its midst. Um, but I think the other thing I would say, just, just in, in relation to what Chuck said, I think the missing piece of the story, and this is a debate that the kind of critical side of political theology raises, is that, um, and you can put this very simply, is liberalism a modality of capitalism or is capitalism a modality of liberalism? And this is kind of Marx's point, um, you know, it's debates on the left, but also debates on the right um, in defense of that. Um, and, and so I think the kind of liberalism, neoliberalism bit is a, is a, is a bit of a smokescreen. We can't, you know, seen in figures like Locke, you can't really ignore the emergence of liberalism and the emergence of capitalism in the Atlantic world. And it's sutured into imperialism and people like Bhikkhu Parekh and, decolonial thinkers, but it, I could, you could look back to a figure like Gandhi, a significant political theologian, I would argue, or someone like Tolstoy in, in the kind of late 19th, early 19th century, also having this kind of insight that the, the, the kind of, what I say, the liberal capitalist state is, is the problem here, and you can't kind of separate, and I think there's been a tendency in liberal thought, particularly in America, to be a bit tone deaf and, and myopic and not see it's is capitalism constitutive of liberalism and however you want to play that if whether it's liberalism and modality of capitalism or capitalism and modality of liberalism there's some kind of relationship here which needs to be accounted for and dual emergence as well and i think that's where the christianity bit and religious bit shows up in, in again in interesting ways either we can have a prosperity gospel which kind of marries these two things very forcibly or a Christian socialism or a liberation theology or kind of Islamic critiques or Jewish, you know, which are very critical and want to uncouple that in some way as well. So, yeah, I think that's the, is, is an important piece to have into the story. Yeah. I mean, a couple, couple things there. I might have disagreements with Luke on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that we can tell a very triumphalist story of the church opposing um uh, the medieval empire 
um, there wasn't much of an empire to begin with. And the investiture controversy was a very brief episode in um, the, 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 the number of inches um, uh, that the church's nose would be up the emperor's butt is basically what that debate was about. It wasn't really about the autonomy as we, we now see actually with a number of integralists, Roman Catholic integralists in the US arguing for this idea of the kind of freedom of the church and stuff like that. Um, the conception of history that they're telling is um, extremely dangerous and not accurate to what was going on. Um, one fact about our world that's very different uh, than anything before effectively um, the 16th century, uh, and this is something that I think historians and sociologists know much better than people in theology like us know, which, which is that um, we lived in an institutionally very poor environment. There were not that many guilds, that many crafts uh, groups. There were not that many organizations that allowed things to go forward. You had villages, you had uh, organizations in towns, but it was not an institutionally rich context. And the church and the state, insofar as there was a state or various forms of political sovereignty, worked mostly hand in glove um, and for very many good reasons to do that. So I think that's um, a, like, a very important story to tell is that in the modern world, we have many more institutional structures uh, which are enormously complicated. And that I think Luke and I have, like we're totally in agreement on that. Ooh, I no, I, I think we have, I think it's a substantial, we'll, we'll leave, we'll move on to the next question, but I think there are some, I would, I would dispute some of your telling. And I think there's a much richer institutional context in, in the medieval context than I think you're, you're giving credit for. But anyway, but that's a, um, that's a different, I think that is a point, a point of kind of both historical conceptual dispute. But anyway, we'll, we'll move on to the next. But the other, the other thing I was going to say is that um, the question of capitalism is really important here. And again, it's easy to make, it's easy to fall back into Manichaean pictures of capitalism. Uh, it doesn't strike me that capitalism has been given a kind of fully responsible picture um, in political theology uh, in the past uh, generation or so. Um, I'm still enough of a child of the 80s and 90s uh, to keep wondering what's the alternative to capitalism. Um, and I still am enough of a person who looks at that world and wonders um, why not have an enormously socially structured capitalism? It's, it's dangerous, it seems to me sometimes how uh, many of the kind of, I would judge them properly, apocalyptic energies um, of the kind of Marxist um, and more radical, uh, more radical Marxist left um, have entered into uh, a discourse of political theology and retained themselves there uh, while reformulating their, uh, their surface logics. It strikes me that we need some kind of serious grappling with the strengths and weaknesses of capitalism and there has been some history of this. I mean, figures like Albert Hirschman tell the story going back to the French physiocrats in the 18th, in the 18th century on this. Uh, his book, The Passions and the Interest, still strikes me as really important. The line of um, broadly, I would say, liberal thinkers who are French, right, from Benjamin Constant through Tocqueville, um, do actually think hard about the relationship between capital and democracy. Um, I don't think we've got this right yet, uh, but it's very easy for uh, us uh, living in these, um, in, in these societies to think that the economic conditions um, are in some sense uh, fundamentally corrupt and evil. Um, and I don't know, I don't, I don't think we fully understand the market systems we are involved in yet. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I would just push back on a little bit. I think, I mean, it's intriguing that you you make the move, Constant, Tocqueville, etc. Yes, they thought about the market and democracy, not the market and liberalism. And that's, and that's a slippage we often see in this conversation. Suddenly there's a switch to democracy as code for, as a, as a placeholder for liberalism. And I'm like, they're actually different. So we need to be clear on that. Secondly, I think... Um, I think there is a very rich tradition of thought, you know, in thinking about the social market. I, I think it's, it's. I, I just think coming from a European context and having this conversation in America, it just feels so different. There's very, very rich, and, and we're thinking about the German context as a social market. You know, I'm at a university, I think I'm right to say, there's not one person who studies the social market in Germany 
And yet this is one of the most successful economies in the modern world. And yet it is, it's not quite capitalism as we know. It's not to say it's not, doesn't have capitalist elements, but the kind of Anglo-American model of capitalism, which we all live under, is not the only form out there. And, and rich traditions of, um, of, of socialist thought, democratic, uh, democratic socialist thought, non-state socialist thought, um, the cooperative movement go back to the 19th century, uh, there's very sophisticated thinking about how you have a kind of social market structure that's not capitalism. Um, but it, it has virtually no airplay in universities in America at all. I don't, so I think there's a, there's a kind of amnesia or ignoring of, of a very rich, that's, that's not this kind of apocalyptic dismissal of capitalism per se. And actually on the ground, I'm, I'm involved in various kind of on the ground efforts um, and and was interviewing this just down the road in North Carolina, a wonderful woman called Molly Henstreet, setting up a whole kind of cooperative structure, reviving textile industry, and working on non-capitalist structures. But again, it it just doesn't fit within the imaginary, I would I'm say. Just, look, all I'm saying is that if, if you want to say that Germany is not a capitalist country, that's fine, but then we're going to need another word for it. Um, and my point was, I thought in this way, maybe agreeing with you, um, but maybe it's also that your defense of it is proving my point, which is that we have this way to stigmatize capitalism as what's really bad. And then we look at places like Germany and say, well, they can't be capitalists because they're good. <laughs> it strikes me that the problem is more at the conceptual level than the empirical level. Um, and the degree to which people in political theology broadly um, have any kind of disciplined self-knowledge uh, of the sort that you were pointing to uh, about the complexities of the various forms of social and economic organization that go under the canopy of capitalism is, is minimal. Um, and it strikes me that we need serious and rigorous thinking about that. Um, and that often what we get, um, and not from not from you, but because I mean, um, uh, often what we get is a kind of semaphoric flag waving. Um, I mean, I think anybody in America, as we know from poll after poll, all sorts of people are asked about, would you like this kind of social system or this kind of social system? And invariably, Americans choose Sweden or Germany, <laughs> and they think they have some version of that. And then when you point it out to them, you're like, oh, well, that, that, can't, that can't work. So it strikes me that that kind of capitalism is completely, uh, uh, is completely uh, interesting and legitimate as long as it has this ongoing language of critique in suspicion embedded in it. And I, I would just say to your point about uh, democracy and liberalism, the most important person who was influenced by Tocqueville and Constant in the English scene, um, as I think you know, was John Stuart Mill. Um, so if you wanna say that that didn't get embedded in liberalism, um, then there's a larger exegetical debate to be had there. Um, but I, I, I agree, there's a, we just need a critical language to think about would be my, my point. And I'll, I'll be quiet now, sorry. Well, it's a very stimulating conversation, um, and the bringing up the sort of the constant reference to the example of Germany and what it says ethically, um, politically about the possibilities of liberalism and capitalism actually brings us back to that World War II moment, um, which is sort of going in the opposite direction. Um, and some of these ideas about political theology are crystallizing in German discourse and have been particularly influenced by the jurist and committed Nazi Carl Schmitt whose work, Political Theology, in 1922, articulated one of the ideas that in its clarity and its sort of appeal for a certain way of thinking has really shaped a lot of thought about the meaning of this term. And I'll quote, he says, all significant concepts of modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts. So the question I wanted to pose to both of you is, do you think that Schmidt's statement is largely true? Um, or are there aspects of the origin and development of modern political thought that his straight line vision of secularization overlooks, both in the influence of theology on this development and both in perhaps origins of modern political thought, liberal thought that have nothing to do with theology. Um, so Luke, let's start with you. Yeah, no, I think, so. I think it's a great question. I mean, I, I mean, the short answer is I think Schmidt is wrong in how he frames it. Um, I, I think, uh, he, he, underlying his view, and I think this is sometimes misinterpreted, I think underlying his view is a rather straightforward secularization narrative or sense of things that 
what were once theological concepts have been kind of imported over. Um, in his view, he was viewing that positively. Others take that as a kind of negative thing. Um, and so, so that they're traveling under a kind of crypto theological warrant that gives them a legitimacy that they wouldn't otherwise have. That's part of what he's saying. But also that somehow the, the, the political usage of these terms empties out the theological, and, and that will be the kind of secularization element of it. Um, and, and to kind of pick up on something both Chuck and I have been arguing for here, um, I think the problem with this view is it, it lacks a kind of interactive dynamic and the traffic going both ways. So to kind of tell us sometimes to uh, use this it can be a problematic kind of analogy. But I think the standard secularization story, which I think operates in most folk who've been through kind of elite institutions in some capacity, um, is if we think about a shower, history is moving in one direction. Um, uh, uh, away from a relig atavistic religious past. Um, and men and women have got to step into the shower, as it were, and be washed clean of their atavistic kind of accretions of foul superstition. And then they'll step out, uh, you know, on the right side of history uh, as rational folk who are able to kind of work and free from magical thinking. And so that that sense of secularization, I think, is a dominant narrative. And so you saw that, um, whether it was the, you know, gross mistakes of the CIA in relation to Iran in 79, um, and, and kind of, because how could this religious figure be the future of a, a modernizing economy and, and structure? And, and so they just couldn't, it was just bad sociology, in my view. It's a very bad policy decision. We see this the whole time, responses to whether it's ISIS, to uh, Trump uh, and kind of Christian evan evangelical groups in America. Like there's no set that these, these should just disappear. Um, uh, and, and the truth is we're not living in a shower, we're living in a jacuzzi. And, and so actually what's, it's, it's stuff is bubbling up from all over the place. And whether you're Franklin Graham defending your confessional, you know, superiority, or uh, you're Richard Dawkins and you're kind of defending a kind of confessional Darwinism, everyone, and this is a kind of Charles Taylor point, everyone's subject to the crosswinds of mutual fragilization, and everyone is having to realize, particularly in a kind of internet globalized age, that their view of the thing, their view of the world, isn't necessarily the view of the world that is coming into being. It's it's all contested and contingent. And so whether you write on your obscure Freudian reading of the Bagda Vita uh, and think nothing of it, and then suddenly you've got in death threats from uh, uh, Jakarta, you know, like, what the hell's happening? And, and that's a story that's repeating itself because because we're now we're living in this kind of global jacuzzi. Sorry, it's unpleasant when the, the water's rather fet, rather fetid. Um, uh, but but yeah, so so I think that's that's part of the problem that Schmidt's line doesn't really get at is this interactive, uh, much more complexifying, uh, uh, constantly mutually imprecated and responsive kind of reality. Then I think the other thing he doesn't really get is that there is there are ways in which the the kind of um, emptying out of uh, or disenchanting, to use a Weberian term, I, I'm not a big fan of that term, but I think in this instance it applies, um, disenchanting of theological notions by taking becoming kind of political theology. It, it doesn't take seriously how we what we have is political ideas becoming enchanted. So take a notion like humanitarianism or human rights, and something like Samuel Moyne's work um, we've had on this on these discussions. But but Didier Fassin looking at humanitarianism as the predominant form of humanitarianism of, of political theology in the modern world. So so there's this there's this way in which what we take to be political ideas are actually are straightforwardly forms of political theology, but we think of them in a kind of imminent frame or a secular, but I think that's just a, that's a category mistake. And then I think there's another way in which it's wrong, which is um, uh, the ways in which, and I think there hasn't been sufficient attention to this, something I'm trying to think about at the moment, that certain genres of political thought, I think are inherently 
political theology. So I would say the tragedy is right from Greek through, however one wants to define it, and there's big debates about that, but the tragic and the use of the tragic as a way of analyzing political events or political processes is in, ineluctably a kind of political theology. And likewise, the apocalyptic. And we see that, you know, the, read any environmental literature of even the most technocratic variety and the use of the apocalyptic in it very explicitly. Um, I just read a book called The New, I think it's called The New Leviathan. And it's a straightforward work of political science kind of drawing on Hobbes, but it's apocalyptic kind of political theology in the raw. It doesn't think it's doing political theology, but it, all the language, because it's deploying the apocalyptic as a category, is just inherently political theology. So I think the problem with Schmidt's view is he, th he thinks that there's this one way move to an emptying out of the theological or metaphysical apparatus. I think we see in one level more straight lines uh, there's more interactive jacuzzi like interactions and then there's ways in which certain kinds of speech act are just inherently forms of political theology and you can't escape that um so yeah i think that's th those are kind of problematic ways i, th I think that the last thing to say and i've been interesting chuck has to say on this i think is and this is a point in kind of sociology of religion and and the, and the notion of the kind of secular what is the secular but when you have the deinstitutionalization, what we see is not necessarily secularization, but deinstitutionalization and pluralization. Both of those things, I think, are problems for liberalism in different ways. Um, but it, when we have the deinstitutionalization, so kind of religion isn't contained within explicitly religious containers, conspiracy theories, uh, this kind of stuff, what we see is the showing up of forms of lived political theology or folk political theology all over the place um and uh, you know we could look trace kind of the use of cult figures whether um uh you know you could look back to stalin but i think we could look at obama uh or uh, trump or you know the, the the kind of the 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 treatment of political figures in a beyond simply a kind of rationalistic empirical red you know technocratic register that they take on an aura a glory if you like um that's a form of lived political theology which i think again um is is rather a straightforward line that isn't this kind of emptying out process that schmidt's pointing to so i'm sure we're all looking forward to the day where we can read luke's article called the global Jacuzzi. Um, but until that day maybe we can <laughs> Turn to Chuck and we can hear some of your thoughts on the insights and limitations of Schmidt's vision of political theology. Well, I just want to say, I, I, Luke, if you are, I, I will be in that jacuzzi with you. And I look forward to the day soon and very soon when we can when we can co jacuzzi together um, after the pandemic. I have, I have a deep phobia about them, so that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of my negative use of them. I want to put everyone else ever getting in one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I so a couple. I I I, large, I think I largely agree with what Luke was saying. A, a couple things just to maybe build on. Um, one quick thing: you used the phrase deinstitutionalization. I agree that there's the movement of these kind of religious energies out of overtly, explicitly religious forms. But I think of something like Q as quite thoroughly institutionalized just on the new institutions of social media and stuff like that. I think one of the problems we have is that when people talk about the, the, the stripping away of institutions and the individualization, we often don't, we often are actually blind to the ways that there are institutions there as well that are actually bad institutions. And it feels like just as in the 19th century, the movement to recognize the social was a kind of century long conceptual struggle for a lot of thinkers. We are in the middle of that as well with a number of different institutional structures, not just say social media, but just in terms of in our lifetimes, the, the recognition of like race and gender as structures um, that are distinct and, and need to be addressed and identified and, and, and sculpted has uh, advanced enormously. And I think about that, that way in which the basic political vocabulary continues to um, expand in in ways, and it feels like it's going to need to again with the social media and stuff like that that's that's happening now, is in the process of 
in fact, in the process of expanding. Um, on Schmidt and the political theology, I will just say one thing about that. Um, Schmidt was more of a polemicist than an analyst. And I think that that's an important thing to realize. Um, I don't think he was actually as uh, a astute an analyst as some other people in his context were. So I think Benjamin, not just because Benjamin is a nicer guy, he probably wasn't, but but he was at least, um, he strikes me as someone, if you think about um, uh, the stuff on uh, on reflections on Gewalt, on violence, you you what, what gets translated as violence, so it's probably not a good idea. Um, you get a lot more nuanced picture. And then I think with uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, you get a much more uh, subtle analysis of what's going on. Um, but what's interesting in our context is that um, Schmidt's tools, which again, I think were more heavily, um, uh, they were more heavily weighted as polemical tools than analytic tools. They're more like cudgels than, than uh, scalpels, um, have been repurposed since the 70s. Um, to be more analytic um, than polemic. And it strikes me that that's um, been illuminating in some situations and not as illuminating in others. Um, and so I feel like this might be a place where Luke and I agree on this, that, that there's a danger sometimes for people to quickly say, yes, um, Schmidt, was a, Schmidt was a Nazi and that's very, very bad, um, but let's go on and use these categories anyway and um, not really do a very critical analysis uh, of the categories. Um, and how they are how they are employed, um, and it seems to me that um, in in that way there's a there's a real problem there. And my final point about Schmidt is uh, there's a great letter where he says um, today um, all all politics is theology um, except the stuff that theologians talk about, <laughs> which is a, a good example of what he means. Because in the end, by claiming that everything is political theology, Schmidt was not trying to open up a space for um, first order theological reflection. Um, he was in some important ways quite metaphysically nihilist. And it's important to recognize that that in this most, um, most innocent way, uh, Schmidt is not um, a person's friend who wants to think theologically, who wants to think that metaphysical questions are important questions on their own terms. Um, Schmidt seems to me to be someone who wants to say, um, the reason these have become political concepts is because people have found uh, it more effectively and more authentically useful as uh, the tools for dif differentiating the friend and the enemy. Um, and it strikes me that that's not, I, I mean, and this is a wager. So this is where it is straight up theology for me. Um, this is not Pascal's, but this is Chuck's wager. Um, it, it strikes me that actually uh, we are not ultimately interested uh, or we need not ultimately be interested in differentiating friend and enemy. Um, it might be that there's another energy there altogether. Um, that's, yeah, that's just all to, quick, quickly, just a quick bit. I mean, I think Chuck's making very, very important points there. Um, I think, and this is, I mean, just in the arcana, this is Eric Pettersson's kind of argument against Schmidt at, at the time. I, and I think it's an important implication of Schmidt's work that people don't pick up on and, and, and is very key in our own day because it's a lived reality for all of us. The implication of Schmidt's thing is to collapse everything into the political. Um, and so there's a totalization of politics. Um, and for all his kind of Catholic, you know, orientation, Schmidt really had no time for eschatology. He's very anti eschatology There was no sense of a, a realm beyond the political or for discourses outside. Everything gets subject to kind of power in that sense. And, and Chuck's right, I think, about the nihilism there. And I think we're faced with a similar moment in our own day, I think, where there's very important critiques of, um, you know, whether it's about gender, racism, all sorts of things going in our own day. But I think there's a way in which certain strands of critical thought and equally certain strands of kind of technocratic liberalism, if I could use that term, because they're operating in a wholly imminent frame and can't take seriously the kind of truth claims of uh, of religion of whatever stripe or, or or kind of metaphysical debates outside of the political uh, about meaning and purpose everything collapses so truth itself gets collapsed into a question of social power and everything gets political and at that point the human gets lost and i think you see this importantly someone like paul gilroy coming out of the kind of 
black, very important black British intellectual um, in his recent uh, lectures, uh, calling for a kind of reparative humanism, I think is pointing in this way, because he's saying, look, at a certain point, if you make everything about social power and the totalization of politics, we lose the dignity of the human and the ability to build coalitions across difference of identity or whatever. Um, and so the kind of protecting and tending of the social uh, and, and of the ways people survive and thrive today uh, is undermined and destroyed, uh, whether by the left or the right. And that's in some ways the history of you know, of, of, of radical movements, whether of the left or the right, fascism, communism, is the destruction of the human in the name of the totalization of politics as such, whatever the structural instantiation of that. And, and so I think there's a, there's a way in which there's a forgetting in radical thought, both on the left and the right, I think today, of the lessons that I think were learned in the 20s and 30s, particularly on the left, looking at the rise of Stalinism and was, you know, was the Stalin simply an aberration or was it a feature of Marxist-Leninist thought? And the conclusion was it was a feature of Marxist-Leninist thought. And so how did you have a kind of humanistic socialism or a humanistic Marxism that, that operated with a sense of a kind of metaphysical beyond the political? And I think that's a very, very, very worrying trend across all ideological spectrums today that I think, which goes back to your question of why does theology matter, whether it's Christian theology, but some robust metaphysical claim that is not reducible to social power and, a tr and that there's truth claims at stake here is crucial, I think, to upholding some sense of you can't just treat humans as, you know, good Kantian sense, treat humans as ends rather than simply means to your ideological project. So Chuck, I, I can, you, can, I, I can I just add one thing here, Ben? What Luke right. is saying strikes me as really important also about the way that talking about liberalism might implicate us in talking about humanism as well. Mm -hmm. and, and it strikes me that these are terms that could use, that they, they do have some elective affinities and they could both use um, a, a pretty interesting rehabilitation, at least as constructive interlocutors. Um, and I, I do feel like, uh, I mean, Gilroy has actually been gesturing at the humanist thing since the Black Atlantic. Uh, it's been it's been there for a while. And it strikes me again that um, in that notion of the liberal conception of the individual as having some privacy, some concern for themselves in some way, there is, however problematically ingrown it might be in some formulations, there is some intuition of the idea that the, um, the self in the liberal world um, is in some important way of, of absolute value. Um, and it strikes me that that's an energy that there could be a connection with, with humanism um, and potentially with other uh, sources of uh, uh, metaphysical insight in the world. It's a kind of di dialogue of wisdoms about that rather than this other form of liberalism, which is kind of the, the liberalism of a hosting of a dialogue of wisdoms through the limited state, through the value of the individual, through the rule of law, and creating a space for that dialogue of wisdoms is a very different kind of liberalism, I think, than this kind of liberal overreach, um, which wants to crowd out any other metaphysical claims. And I think it's, I think in doing that, it seeds uh, uh, that ground, its own, its own ground, and I think then produces these kinds of counter reactions that want to totalize politics as such and reduce all truth claims to social power, questions of social power. And I think that's a very dangerous, and we're seeing that played out across the world today. Well, you know, I think this, this is the theme and, and we're coming up a little bit short on time, but I just wanted to raise, raise the question, you know, this third category, Chuck, you mentioned of the kind of the liberal that defines themselves against religion and thereby becomes a kind of political theology, but that would never admit itself as, as such. And Luke, you also mentioned the example of John Rawls, who is very kind of exemplary in this regard, which is if, you know, if you look at his own thinking, it's so deeply shaped by Protestant theology, religious thought and reflection. But when you look at his justification, his arguments for liberalism, he, he paints a picture in which religion has very little, if any, role to play, except as a negative role. And then in political liberalism, he lets it back in, but still it's kind of through like a promissory note, like Yes, religion can say something, but only if later it figures out how to 
make that argument in terms of constitutional liberal thought. And so, you know, also with, with Habermas, there's a similar idea of this translation. So I wanted, you know, for these kind of thinkers who are a bit more charitable towards religion, but they still are placing limits as to when and where and how and under what conditions and what would be a legitimate sort of kind of contribution to liberal thought religion can make. Do you think that these kind of arguments that are still sort of creating a closed boundary for liberalism and the kinds of justifications that are legitimate, but that are trying to somehow be more charitable to religion, are they adequate? Are they limited? In what ways are they limited? Um, and particularly in light of this last thought you were raising, Luke, about the sort of hosting of, of different forms of, of wisdom through the liberal state. Very briefly, if I could get, we could get some of your thoughts on, on the limits of that kind of more ostensibly religiously charitable, but still very explicitly limiting vision of the relationship between uh, liberal politics and political theology. Um, so Chuck, maybe we can start with you. Great, sure, yeah, I thought you were gonna start with Luke. Um, yeah, I would just say, um, so, and this is segueing into what you're asking for, um, I, I would not say necessarily that liberalism needs to be the energy that funds the dialogue between humanities or between construals of the human. Um, a, a, a liberalism can be quite minimal in the sense of just restricting itself to a very um, narrow space of legislative or um, uh, political policy issues and create a lot of opportunities for other institutions, other energies to exist in that in that context and have those dialogues. So it might be that humanism and liberalism have some assonances with each other, but they don't necessarily fuse into one thing. Um, and that would be the way that I think of uh, what both Habermas and uh, Rawls are trying to do. And I would say um, they both strike me now in my 50s as much more interesting and much more uh, attractive and much less, uh, much less square, as it were, uh, than they did when I was in my 20s. Um, my admiration for their projects has, has uh, and respect for their projects has uh, very much increased. Um, I don't agree with what they're, I think they're doing in some basic ways, but I do think that the energies that they are trying to get at, this idea that um, we can find a way to talk to each other beyond um, the immediate particularities of my self, uh, of my self understanding, and your self understanding, that strikes me as a very um, uh, deep and important thing to uh, ask of us. It seems to me that if I would disagree with them, it might be that they um, assume too quickly that religious discourses are in this way self enclosed and not able to engage in these kinds of conversations. Um, whereas I think historically it's been the case that religious discourses, like all other forms of human discourse, have been enormously gymnastic and flexible and, and have generated energies to extend and estrange themselves in really radical ways. I think a, a, a Christian speaking Christianese today would sound very strange to a Christian speaking Christianese in the 13th century, let alone the sixth century. Um, and so it seems to me that a liberal, as it were, virus has uh, infected uh, Christianity, not entirely in bad ways, um, and in ways that make it much more amenable for um, a kind of Rawlsian or Habermasian picture. I would say also that, um, uh, well, Rawls is not with us anymore, and Habermas is continuing to Habermas, um, but they both have had, it seems to me, more successful formulators um, in recent years uh, than their own uh, texts have been. Uh, I've mentioned already Cecile Laborde, whose book Liberalism's Religion strikes me as really, really good as an attempt to develop Rawlsian thought. Um, and I would point out the philosopher Amy Allen, uh, who has done amazing work, it seems to me, on Habermas in relation to various, uh, various critics of Habermas. Uh, and I, I think that um, the work that is being done in these traditions, it's very much ongoing, is pushing these traditions in ways that render them more amenable to talking to um, thick political theological, self-consciously political theological uh, traditions like our own. Yeah, so one I, last I, thing. I, so what, sorry, one last thing. Um, the the point, the most interesting book on Rawls that I have read lately is really on this, and it's Eric Nelson's little book, Liberalism's uh, the Theology of Liberalism, 
where he really makes the case that Rawls's Augustinianism is underlying his commitment to egalitarianism. Um, and it's a very fun argument that in fact, his basic commitment to equality over liberty as a priority, as a primordial liberal virtue um, is because Rawls favors Augustinianism over Pelagianism. Um, and that strikes me as a really fun way to think about Rawls. Um, and Nelson, of course, finds this very regretful uh, about Rawls. But I'm, speaking as an Augustinian, I'm not entirely sure I, I do. But um, hey, I'll just mention that as an example. Sorry, Luke, I didn't mean to run into you. I know. Yeah, no, just very briefly, because I only want another question. I do apologize also to the people who've asked wonderful questions and we haven't got to. But um, just, yeah, so briefly, I think I think this, I, I would slightly go behind the question. I think there's a more basic question we're confronted with that liberalism is an answer to. And that's the question of what is politics and what is politics for? Mm -hmm. And it, it strikes me that, um, and I think we do need to, and there's been a lot of work around this, but I think, you know, at its most basic, when I when I encounter someone I disagree with or don't like, I can do one of four things. I can either kill them, I can create a system and structure to coerce them so I don't have to listen to them and, and it can make them do what I want or make them agree with me. I can create conditions that force them to flee or I can flee or I can do politics, i.e. I can negotiate some kind of common life amid asymmetries of power and rival visions of the good. And that, you know, it might be say broadly Aristotelian, but I think it's a, across, that's a global, some sense of how do you forge a common life amidst asymmetries in power and when you encounter people you disagree with or dislike. And that's operating in my neighborhood, in my church, at the state, at the globe level, whatever level. And so I think liberalism is an institutional answer to a collective problem of how we do politics. It's one way of doing that. I think it needs to recognize it's a, it's a wonderfully rich way of answering that question that has important insights of how to, it's not the only way of doing it. And it's not the only way that generates politics either. And the problem is liberalism thinks it's the only, it, it, it like some you know, new kid on the block thinks, oh, I came up with the best answer. And I'm like, look, other people over millennia have come up with answers to this question of how do you form a common life? So I think that's, mm -hmm. I think this is a more basic question and, and there are religious answers to that question and non-religious answers to that question. Um, but I think let's, let's get back to that question and then situate the liberalism conversation in the what is politics and what's it for and the good of association element. Well, I, as as Ben said, we're we're coming up short on time, and your uh, responses to our questions are so rich that we've been hesitating to interrupt you. But if you'll allow us, we'll ask one more um, final question. I think it's fair to say, and I've heard both of you make some version of this observation, that we find ourselves in a society where people uh, and groups representing a very broad range of of worldviews and identities have come to feel a sense of threat, and in many cases, a sense of antagonism vis-a-vis uh, -vis outgroups or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a set of variously defined others. Certainly in American society, pluralism uh, has in many ways turned into polarization, resulting in, among other things, the crisis of American democracy that we saw with the last election cycle. Luke, um, you argue that in a world riven with conflict, Christians should um, direct their attention to ways, as you were just describing, of building a common life between what you call um, different others. But that vision, um, as you well know, will arise skepticism in many quarters. First, because religion and its corresponding moral commitments appear to be just such basic and stubborn axes of social and political division, um, and perhaps also because some of the most prominent articulations of political theology, as we've discussed, take a thoroughly agonistic or conflictual view of politics. Uh, Schmidt certainly comes to mind in that connection. So I want to ask you, how can religion and religious thought be a solution to the various social and political crises we face, rather than a source of fragmentation and distortion? Luke, let's start with you. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I think I I, I don't want to be boosterish about religion per se. Um, you know, I, it's both can be part of the solution, can can be part of the problem. You know, but so can liberalism. You know, liberalism is equally 
polarizing and as divisive as we've just seen on January the 6th, um, you know, and so the, it's, it, there's a problem with the idea that somehow religion is especially divisive. I'm like, no, that's nonsense and empirically falsifiable. Um, you know, any form of, uh, any form of political ideology is disputable when it, when it turns political and i.e. an order, a way of ordering life together is inherently disputable, contingent, has a history which will be contested and in certain material conditions will be highly divisive. Um, that's just, should be a given and, and, and different religious streams of thought are, you know, have, have been and haven't been divisive in equal measure as have various secular streams mm. of thought as well. So, you know, socialism, communism, whatever, whatever it is. So, so I think we just need to kind of park the idea that there's religion has a divis div divisiveness problem. Everyone has a divisiveness problem. Everyone has a polarization. That's that jacuzzi idea. Everything's contested. Just in certain, certain ways, religion shows up as the other to a liberal imaginary that imagines that somehow liberalism is lib religion is particularly prone to causing division. I think that's just nonsense, and we need to, you know, blow mm. that up. Um, that's not actually violent in imagery. Um, but I think the 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 ways in which going back to what I was saying about politics, there are forms of religious thought which you know take a notion like love your neighbour in Christianity, uh, which can generate orientation to. Um, a, a common life and in Christianity and I'll just talk about that's the tradition I'm most expert in um, the the there's a strong advocacy of love thy enemy you know so I I don't think on the one hand where I think Schmidt is right and I'm slightly disagreeing with something Chuck said earlier I think when we're always inside of friend enemy relations the question then is the, and there's always an other, we're always imagining whether you're in the Ming Empire, your Athenian city states, or whether you're Christian Europe, you're always imagining yourself over against internal and external others. Um, the, the question is then, how do you generate the quality and character and moral commitments that don't lead you to kill, coerce, or cause your enemies to flee and recognize that the enemy has, might have something to teach you? And I think that's where we need to interrogate different strains of theology, different strains of religious thought. But I think there are rich traditions of moral wisdom and political wisdom in all religions um, that can find points of connection and exchange and cross-pollination. And it's those we need to attend to and, and recognizing that under certain conditions, those same thoughts, and this is the kind of Augustinian point I would share with Chuck, can can be rendered toxic as well. You're, you know, good projects can turn bad very quickly. And just lastly, I'll say, I think one of the problems for liberalism, and Chuck might disagree with me on this, I think one of the problems with liberalism is, if then it's about the formation of people with the quality and character of, relation, of relationality or virtues, we might say, who can hold tension, deal with ambiguity, don't rush as a reflex measure to kill and coerce, but actually take time to listen and have the kind of epistemic humility, where do those people come from? And I think we are in a bit of a crisis at the moment. The kind of liberal institutions take the modern university is producing technocrats without virtue. Um, and whether it's your Josh Hawley's or Ted Cruz's, who are, let's face it, products of elite liberal institutions, all the folk who are busy creating technologies like AI, you know, without restraint or attention to the impact they're having on human communities, you know, all, all the wonderful graduates of Duke and Princeton and New York University who end up in Wall Street and tank the economy seemingly every 10 years. So, like, there's a problem with our questions of formation and character. Um, and this, this problem of, I think that's where religion both well and badly can both malform people, but also attends to questions of the formation of virtue. And I think this is where a, a kind of a, 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 an overly technocratic view of liberalism, I don't think it's the only view of liberalism out there, but it, but it has been a dominant strain in post-war America, which thinks you can separate ethics and politics. Um, and I think that when I say ethics, I really mean the formations of per people able to sustain liberal relationships. Where are those people going to come from? 
Um, I don't think it has to be religious communities. There are many kinds of communities can do that. But I think that's a major conceptual and empirical problem which has to be wrestled with because we're seeing the, the institutional investments in education particularly are not panning out. You know, that it, it, as of all the examples I've just given, it, it producing technocrats or elites without virtue who are kind of destroying the world around us. And, and, and it's, that's the greater threat than, frankly, a few religious nutcases storming capital. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, let's attend to that problem and then this question of, you know, how how do people who 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 are can carry on meaningful political relationships of, 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 and under the terms I've defined it, where do they come from and how are they cultivated? Mm. Chuck, I want to put that same question to you before we close. How can religion and religious thought be a solution to the various social and political crises we face, rather than a source of or contributor to those problems? I um I think uh, Luke and I have a lot of agreement on this stuff. I think um it, it's going to be both. Uh, you know, my favorite line is always from Homer Simpson. Uh, like uh, he says about beer, beer is the cause of and the solution to all the world's problems. Uh, in similar ways, uh, religion may be as well. Um, I think there's too many forms of it of you know, religion as a category uh, to really make a generic statement. But I do think that um, let me put it in this biggest context as I think about it, um, we spent as a species about the last 11,000 years differentiating ourselves into the various different cultures, languages, communities, religions um, that we have um, you know, uh, achieved and populated every ecological niche around the world. And we've really only been trying to um, kind of come together again as a species for about 200 years. And we've really only seriously been attempting um, in the past several generations to actually try in a genuinely, at least sometimes genuinely egalitarian way uh, to come together. So it's not surprising that we're very bad at this. What I would say about religions is that because religious energies are often, not always, but often authentically held by individuals, um, what we see is that the religious energies people have ought to be the sources out of which their most fundamental um, efforts are made at inhabiting this world honestly and truthfully with others. Um, in other words, it feels to me like it would be um, not only aesthetically dishonest, but, but impractical if we were to try to uh, set aside our deepest convictions um, as a modus vivendi for inhabiting a world together. Um, we might be able to live beside each other, but I don't think we would be able to live with each other. And like Luke, I think we ought to live with each other. Now, I, I take Luke's point about the um, inescapability of enemies in this world. And Jesus, of course, did tell us uh, to love our enemies. Jesus did not say we should not have them. Um, and I, I, I totally agree with that. But I do think that many of these religions have a kind of, again, wager on the idea that there is some there's some possibility of genuinely encountering other people um, in a way that's quite profound and quite motivating for a lot of people. And so insofar as we can find ways to help the various religions and the various other forms of this moral energy, many of them humanistic, many of them not theological or theistic or any kind of mystic at all, um, that seems to me an important task for the next several centuries, if not millennia. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop. <laughs> um, but Chuck Matthews, Luke Brotherton, thank you so much for joining us. What a fascinating conversation it's been. Honor and pleasure. Thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. I wish we had more time, but thank you. <laughs> thanks also to our sponsors, the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us today. We certainly hope that you'll do it again on Friday, May 7th at 9 a.m. Eastern for what will be the eighth and final installment in this series. Uh, ben and I will have the great pleasure then of welcoming Joseph Chan and David Wong to discuss Confucianism and modern political thought. Please note again that that event will begin at 9 a.m. Eastern, um, bright and early, 6 a.m. Pacific on the West Coast, not at our usual time. Thanks again and see you then. Thank you all. <laughs>